Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you. And uh, welcome back tonight. We're going to talk about the church. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Ephesians chapter 1. It talks about the blessings of God. Um, and then Paul goes on after verse 14 when he starts at verse 15. He prays for the congregation, for the church in the city of Ephesus. For this reason, he says, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for, for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. This is really my prayer for you throughout this whole course that we have been doing, all, of, all four of the modules, as we have looked at the Bible, as we have journeyed right through the Old Testament, the New Testament, and now as we look at that big picture and putting the thoughts together uh, and looking at major themes that we find in the Bible. My prayer for you, my prayer for myself, is that God will use His Word to help us to get to know Him better. That's ultimately the purpose. And, and after Paul prays, he says, I, I, I pray that your eyes may be open. I pray that God's power may be working in you. He talks about that power in verse 19. And in verse 20, he says, That power which he exerted in Christ when he raised him, Jesus, from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet, and appointed him to be head over everything. And now I want you to listen to the next phrase, for the church. So God sent Jesus into this world. Jesus died. God, God's power um, had Jesus rise from the dead. And then he seated him on the throne on the right hand of God the Father. We've looked at Jesus and who he is a few weeks back. And he says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. It's, it really blows my mind. And I don't think I understand fully what Paul really meant when he said, that God did all of this for the church, and the church is the body of Christ, and it's the fullness of Him, of Jesus, who fills everything. And that tells me that the church is very, very important to God. In fact, I believe it's the way that God is working in the world today. And when I talk about church tonight, I'm not talking about one specific denomination or local church. I want to talk about, and we're going to talk primarily especially as we go through the first half of the lecture, we're going to talk about the church as we find it in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. But I find this comment by the Apostle Paul really astonishing, uh, almost mind-blowing, that, that God gave himself, Jesus gave himself up for the church. And we find that in Ephesians 5 as well, when Paul uh, uses the image of Jesus giving himself up for the church and he uses that to encourage men and women to be in a, good in a good marriage or married relationship. And again, he said that Jesus gave himself up for the church. Now, if I am part of the church, if you are part of the church, it makes us very, very important in God's sight. Not that we can put a sticker on our, uh, on our um, shoulder and, and pat ourselves on the back. Nothing that we have done. It's entirely by God's grace. And that's the other point that, that Paul makes very clearly in this very same letter. It's by God's grace that we have been saved. When God saves us, He puts us into the body of Christ, which is the church here in this world. Now, the church finds its expression in local churches around the world. But you and I belong to the church of Jesus Christ. And, and that makes us very, very special in God's sight. So before we get into the lecture time, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for giving us another opportunity to learn more <clears throat> about this picture that is painted for us in the scriptures. We thank you for your revelation. We thank you that you designed the world, that you designed us to reflect your image. And even when we sinned, rebelled against you, Lord, you came and you pursued us with your salvation and uh, you did that through Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins.
we thank you that you not only saved us to be in a relationship with yourself, but also to be part of your family, to be part of your body, to be part of your church here on earth in preparation for that glorious day when Jesus will come back to take us to be uh, forever in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for what we are able to learn from your word. And I pray Paul's prayer for us that through all of this, we may know you and know you better. We, we're on this journey and we thank you for this journey that we have been on and pray that you would continue to be with us as we journey with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me sketch the uh, picture so far <clears throat> on that canvas that God is busy painting the picture. God created the universe because God is God and He is the Creator. He can do everything. He can do anything. There's nothing impossible for God. God also created mankind and He created us in His image. And He chose by, by His grace to reveal Himself to us. Mankind rebelled. We sinned against God. Um, and we deserve God's punishment or God's judgment. However, God in His mercy initiated salvation when He came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. The rest of the Bible is about God in relationship with His own creation. God pursuing His own creation. And it culminated in the coming of Jesus Christ uh, in this world when Jesus died and gave His life for us. And then when Jesus ascended to heaven, and this is what we looked at last week, uh, God sent His Holy Spirit to be with us, to empower us, to regenerate us, to bring us into a relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit continues to dwell in us because He is the one who produces fruit in our lives. He is the one that, who empowers us to do what we cannot do in our own strength. In other words, He gives us gifts. And it's the Holy Spirit who grows the church. And all of what we have said so far then lays the foundation to where we are tonight, and that is looking at the church of Jesus Christ. So in the previous lecture, we looked at the person and the work of, of the Holy Spirit, who is the third person in the Trinity. Uh, we confirmed the fact that, that the Holy Spirit receives the same honor and glory and praise as the Father and the Son, and therefore He's part of the Trinity. And uh, He was given on that day of Pentecost, uh, and that was a once-off historical event. But as a result of his, his coming into this world on the day of Pentecost, He is now permanently at work in the world and lives and dwells permanently in the believer so that He enables us to do, uh, to live for the glory of God and to do His work, uh, God's work here on earth. It is the Holy Spirit who baptizes the believers into the body of Jesus Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit who then produces fruit in us, and He is the one who empowers us with gifts in order to serve the kingdom of God and to serve the church. Now tonight we're going to look at the church. The, what is the church? What is God's purpose for the church? Some of the historical developments, um, I'm going to give you really just a five or a ten minute little brief uh, insight into the history of the church, and we obviously have to do it in big chunks uh, as we journey through church history. And then we will be looking at um, some denominational boundaries um, as we look at different varieties of the church. And obviously over the last 2,000 years, uh, the church has split into a multitude of different denominations and groupings, and we'll be looking at that. And uh, in all of this, I trust that you will uh, come to an understanding of the importance of the church. The church really goes back to Genesis 12 when God called Abraham. And God entered into a covenant with Abraham and invited Abraham into that relationship. Uh, in fact, the church goes back to the mind of God even before the creation of the universe. That's another thing that Paul states very clearly in terms of God's plan uh, before the creation of the world. In, also in the same book that we read earlier on Ephesians uh, chapter 1 where Paul says we have been elected before the creation. When we go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus refers to the church, the book of Acts is all about the church. It's really all about church planting and the expansion of the church. Now, the church, the New Testament church is taking root. And uh, when you go through the book of Acts, you find uh, the, the uh, missionaries, Paul and others, going around the world, and they were planting churches. And it culminates um, when you go to the book of Revelation, and you find... 
uh, from every tribe and nation and tongue around the world, uh, you find people in front of the throne of God, bringing praise and honor and glory to God. And that is where it all should be ending, uh, where we uh, live in the presence of God and our lives then in perfect conditions will be for the glory of God forever. And many other places in the book of Revelation, I encourage you to go and read um, the prescribed uh, chapters that I have uh, in the notes there. When we look at the church, we're talking about the study of ecclesiology. The word ecclesia uh, means a church or a gathering. Uh, that's a Greek word, and obviously then uh, we, from there we get the word ecclesiology, the study of the church. And so this is what I'm introducing you to tonight. We only have time to scratch the surface. Um, almost every one of the topics that I will raise tonight can be developed into a full study, and oftentimes they are, and many volumes of books have been written on all of those. But when we talk about the church, we really talk about the community of believers, and that God guides His children in, in this world by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, and through the church, and that's the fellowship of believers. So, we talked about God, we talked about how God operates in the world, and when God continues to speak to us or to meet with us, He does so through the Holy Spirit. We saw that last week because it's the Holy Spirit who confirms in my spirit that I am a child of God. It's the Holy Spirit who guides, who whispers into my life and into my ear uh, to hear His voice, to convict me of sin, to guide me in decisions that I make. And primarily the, the Holy Spirit is using the Bible, the Word of God, to do that. And so those two play a very, very important role in our lives. But we cannot underestimate the third way in which God is guiding, and that is through the church and through the community of believers. I think I've said this in a different, in a different context already, but throughout 2,000 years, there can't be anything new that anybody can discover in the Word of God. And therefore, oftentimes when people come and say, I've got a brand new idea that I got from the Bible, I want to say to them, I don't think there's anything brand new. Because after 2,000 years, there can't be anything brand new. Uh, it's all been revealed, and the scriptures are there to guide us in that. However, when someone comes with a, a, a so-called brand new idea, the best thing you can do, is to go to your community of believers and say, I have a brand new idea which I want to bounce off you. It's when people don't do that that they get into serious trouble because they run off on a tangent and they get involved in different false teachings and beliefs because they haven't checked with their fellow believers. And by fellow believers, I mean the people with whom I belong to the same community of faith, my wider body of faith, which is the church in a city or in a country, and we also belong to the community of faith throughout all the years. And many things have been written up. Uh, books on the, the Bible. Uh, we call them commentaries. And those have been written to help and to guide. They're not all necessarily correct or uh, right in their beliefs. But at least it's a guideline for us to follow. And that's why the community of believers is so important. Now in the notes that Kevin Roy put together, he says, and this is a direct quote, of these three, the Spirit, the Word, and the Church, the Church is the most problematical, furnishing the most jarring and disturbing contrast between the ideal and the reality. And I cannot agree more with that statement. Because here we have the Church of Jesus Christ, the absolute ideal. In fact, and I may say this again a little bit later on, I believe the Church is a foretaste of heaven. The, the church is the place where people experience God, where they experience praise of God, where they experience peace and forgiveness, and uh, it's a redemptive community, and all those wonderful things we read in the Bible. And that's the ideal. And it's, it's seldom that you find a church uh, or a church environment where the ideal has been reached. In fact, if it does, then it probably will be heaven itself. Uh, because here on this earth, I don't think we'll ever be reaching that final ideal. Although God is with every believer, and we do believe that, uh, that God lives in me. Uh, we confirmed that last week through the Holy Spirit, uh, um, God lives and dwells in me. But at the same time, God does not want any believer to be alone. And that's a biblical principle. The principle of fellowship, the principle of living in community with other people. Even right at the beginning, God said, it is not good for Adam to be alone. 
for the man to be alone. And he made Eve to be a companion for him. And, and in that, God laid down a principle, and that is that we're not ever meant to dwell on our own, to live alone, or to be lonely. And I believe in the faith community, we need to uh, apply that very same principle, and that is when God saves a person, God is very quick to bring that person into a community of faith. In a sense, and by way of, of illustration, when you think about a newborn baby, uh, I think humans are uh, part of a, a minority of species where a, a newborn cannot exist in and of him or herself. Uh, a newborn baby born and left out in the field will surely die because it needs the nurturing of parents or of adults uh, to help it to grow. And in that sense, uh, it is, or by way of illustration, it is the same in the faith community. When a person is born into the faith community or uh, being given the rebirth, as Jesus said, you have to be born again or born from above. Uh, he said that to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. I believe that God is very quick to add that newborn Christian baby into a faith community where that person can be nurtured and be grown uh, to ultimately become a, uh, a mature Christian him or herself. In the Old Testament, the community that I've been talking about, the faith community, uh, is uh, or was Israel, the people of God. In the New Testament, this community is called the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And so this is what we are looking at tonight. God's ultimate purpose uh, in the big picture on that canvas that I have tried to paint, and I hope you have some kind of a, even a, a vivid picture in your mind uh, as God is busy putting the, the strokes on the canvas. I believe that God's eternal purposes are going to be met. God has an eternal purpose, and His eternal purpose was seen in creation when creation was very good, right at the beginning, where He put mankind in charge of His own creation of the earth. It was perfect in relation to Himself, uh, perfect in relation to one another, and also they lived in harmony with nature around them. However, sin disturbed that picture. We have seen that, and we've been on that journey. Uh, and then God is in the, in the business of restoring His own painting, if you wish. Uh, he is busy restoring His own creation. Uh, he did so finally by sending Jesus into this world. And when Jesus died, uh, He was God's final answer, God's final revelation um, to come and, and tell us that God is a loving God and God wants to restore His image in us. And this picture will find its, to use the word, consummation, its final, final, final picture. Uh, when, when Jesus returns, uh, something we'll look at uh, two lectures from now, we'll look at, at the second coming of Jesus. But God's original intention will then have reached its fulfillment when Jesus comes back. But in the meantime, we are living here on earth in perhaps less than the ideal situation in the church of Jesus Christ. And that is what we are looking at tonight. What's the role in, the, in this picture? The church is not an accident. Uh, the church is not just an afterthought. It wasn't a matter of, uh, well, you know, God worked through Israel in the Old Testament. Let, let's create another little new nation here. Uh, in fact, the church is, uh, is a continuation of the idea of Israel, but in a, in a real sense also very different from the Old Testament Israel. And I believe that God is using the church in this dispensation to serve as a foretaste of what is to come. It is like entering into the foyer of a home. The home is there. It's a reality. And we know that we're going to be invited into that home. In fact, I'm already inside the home. But at the moment, we're dwelling in the, in the foyer or maybe in the living room. We, we're not, we're not in, allowed into the bigger house yet. That bigger house is going to be the new earth and the new heaven. But right now, we're dwelling in, that, uh, in those rooms in the front. Uh, where the church is a place where God's children are nurtured, where they're encouraged, uh, where they are equipped to reach out and draw others to, to God as well. Now, the sinful reality is that the ideal church is a place of forgiveness, peace, and harmony. It's a true Garden of Eden. That's where God is heading with the church and with His world. But the sad reality, and now I'm quoting again from Kevin Roy's notes, he says, the sad reality is that the church is divided into thousands of competing sects and is filled with hypocrisy, scandals, corruption, 
pride, arrogance, selfishness, greed, ignorance, superstition, unbelief, and all manner of wickedness. doesn't sound like the church you belong to, does it? I hope it doesn't. But when you look at church history over 2,000 years, this is part of the picture, unfortunately. And that is the sad reality of church made up of sinful human beings. We are very, very capable of sinning against God and therefore uh, messing up God's ideal for us even here on earth. So does this sinful reality of history and even around us where churches are folding, churches are in conflict, and I have personally dealt several times in my lifetime with church conflict, not uh, sometimes within the church where I was pastoring, but Uh, More often than not, it was as a consultant for other churches where I had to go and help. And and sometimes you have horrific pictures that are playing out uh, where churches are in major conflict with one another. But does all of that mean that the church is not valid or uh, it is redundant or is not important? Well, actually, no. Uh, Because the church is still the way that God wants to operate in this world to extend His kingdom into this world. But since we live on this side of the grave, in other words, we're not in heaven yet, we must turn to God's own revelation, the Word of God, and to look at the ideal and always hold up that ideal before us. And in a mini way, in a personal way, this is true for every single one of us. God's ideal for me as a Christian is that I live sinless, that I live a life of of glory to Him, that I glorify Him in literally everything I do. Every thought, uh, every, every step I take, every move I make must be to the glory of God. Is that reality in my life? Well, unfortunately it is not because I still allow sin, unfortunately, to come into my life. Now, if that is happening with me as a person, if you put a hundred or five hundred of us together and you start multiplying the sins that we have, then unfortunately the church is not the ideal place in in realistic terms, but in ideal terms, in terms of biblical terms, we have to strive for the ideal. Because I'm not going to sit back and say, well, you know, I'm just giving up. I'm a sinner anyway, and I'm just going to go on sinning because I'm, you know, I can't win this battle. I I don't think any of us would want to argue like that. We always live for the ideal. We always strive to do better. We always strive to serve God better, to praise Him more, and to live with less sin in our lives. And similarly, we have to go to the Word of God and say, what is God saying about the church that will help us to understand what God's ideal really is? When we do a study of the church, when we study what is known as ecclesiology, we really start with the beginning, at the beginning, and we go back to the Old Testament. We look at God's kingdom as God revealed Himself through the Old Testament. We've uh, been on this journey before where we talked about God's revelation. And we talked about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And every time we have started in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament is as relevant to our study as is the New Testament. And the biggest mistake that we can make as Christians is to believe that God only really, really started working in the New Testament. And before long, you have two gods like Marcion uh, in the second century. And we don't want to do that. So we need to go back to the Old Testament and ask the question, how did God work in the Old Testament? Where is the Old Testament in inverted commas church? How does it operate and what does it look like? Well, God only has one plan of salvation. Uh, we've, we've seen that again and again uh, already. A plan that started before the creation of the world. A plan that culminated in the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. And when He died and rose from the dead, and and God is now operating through the church. That is God's plan. Now, this plan will culminate fully when Jesus is coming back at the second coming. For this very reason, because there's only one plan, oftentimes scholars refer to a word that you don't find in the Old Testament, and that is the church of Jesus in the Old Testament, or the church of God in the Old Testament, or God's church, or the church in the Old Testament. Now, of course, the word gathering is um, not only a Greek word, but also a Hebrew word, so obviously the word was used in the Old Testament, but the concept that, as we use it today, as a theological concept, the church, is not necessarily used in the same way. But in the Old Testament, those believers were referred to as the people of God, the family of God, the nation of God, the community of believers, 
uh, and in that sense, they represent the church of God in the Old Testament. As Christians, we, when we study the Old Testament, we can, we can learn from the principles and the guidelines in the Old Testament without becoming legalistic about it. And that's one of the dangers, is that we go to the Old Testament and we simply apply all of the laws in the Old Testament to us. That's something that Paul uh, had to endure with and that he struggled with when people wanted to bring Old Testament laws into the New Testament era. But it doesn't mean because the, some of the Old Testament laws have been fulfilled by Jesus, it doesn't mean that they are redundant. The, there are principles and guidelines in the Old Testament with, that we can still find and still can live by even in our New Testament era. Concepts like holiness, concepts like forgiveness, um, being redeemed, um, being uh, brought into the presence of God and living for His glory, all of those we find in the Old Testament. When we looked at salvation in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament era, uh, on a previous occasion, we have confirmed the fact that uh, people in the Old Testament were saved by faith because they believed in God, not because they kept the law. And this is a, this is a very easy mistake to make. And that is, because I'm doing the law, because I'm keeping the Sabbath and I'm not uh, cursing my neighbor and I love my neighbor and so on, therefore I am saved. It's a very easy mistake even to make in the New Testament era. And we have to say that in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, people were saved because they believed in God. The law was given to regulate their behavior. And the, the law became an expression of their love and their faith, uh, their love for God and their faith in God. And so the, even the sacrificial system was there as an expression of their faith. And we've said this on a previous occasion. They needed to believe in God in order to bring their sacrifices and then believe that God had heard them and that they are redeemed. Now, because of the anticipated coming of the Messiah, the Old Testament people, therefore, and this is what theologians are saying, they have, in a certain sense, been the church of Jesus in the Old Testament, and therefore they are saved based on the fact that Jesus died, not in retrospect, but in anticipation of the Messiah that come. Now, they didn't know that the Messiah was necessarily, or they didn't necessarily know that the Messiah was going to come and die on the cross. But as we look back, we can say, because they put their faith in God, they are now saved based on what Jesus ultimately came uh, to do for, for us. And so Grudem says in his little booklet that we are using, all true believers, regardless of what time period they lived in, make up the true church. Now, when you fast forward the picture and you go to Revelation, then you have the church of God in the presence of, uh, of God around the throne, represented in the 24 elders, 12 Old Testament tribes and 12 New Testament apostles. And the 24 represent both the Old Testament and the New Testament believers in the presence of God. And as we know, Revelation is primarily made up of symbolic language, but with, with strong messages coming through to help us understand what we believe. Some of the lessons we learn from the Old Testament is that God created order, and in the New Testament, Paul speaks about that kind of order when he talks about uh, what seems to be a fairly chaotic situation in 1 Corinthians, when the church abused some of the gifts, for example, and Paul reminded them in 1 Corinthians 14, God is a God of order. Now, that principle goes all the way back to the Old Testament when God created the world and there was a particular order. And when God called Israel, Abraham initially, and then when Moses led the people of, of God, uh, the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, in the, um, in the desert of Sinai, God gave them the law, and God ordered their behavior, and that's what the law is all about. So the law is about order. It helps us to understand that God is a God of order. God is a holy God. It's another lesson we learn from the Old Testament. And several times in the New Testament, this is quoted. We need to live holy because God is holy. And we cannot simply, now that we are believers and believing in Jesus, and now that we have been redeemed and saved, we can't live a life of carelessness. Uh, and that is we just um, go in, in, and, and live in sin. Uh, we strive to be holy because God is a holy God. Also, God wanted His people to glorify Him among other nations. 
Now, this is the major failure of Israel in the Old Testament, and that is they never really took their belief or their faith into the rest of the world. They didn't live like that. Number one, they fell into sin again and again. In fact, they allowed the, the other nations to influence them more often than not. And so they failed in proclaiming God as a holy God to other nations, and for that they were punished. And God disciplined His nation by dealing with sin in a severe manner. Sometimes you see it in individuals. Uh, when Achan took some of the, um, uh, the, the loot in, in Jericho, God punished the nation as they moved uh, to the next city, Ai, to, to take that. Uh, and you see that, generally speaking, through the laws, if a person does X, then there, there are punishments being, uh, being handed down to that particular person. So God instituted the principle of discipline. Again, we see the principle being applied in the New Testament. I find it quite interesting that as, as the, and whether this is the way God's, uh, God operated, I don't know, but as the nation of Israel moved into the land of Canaan, it's almost like, when Achan stole some of the, the loot, that it, it was like God was punishing him to be a lesson, to make out of him almost an example of God's discipline on the nation. And right at the beginning, as the, as the church started out, in Acts chapter 5, we have Ananias and Sapphira also drop dead before the congregation because they lied to God. And it's almost like right here at the beginning of the church, God needed to say something to the church. Now, it doesn't mean that every time I lie, or every person, or every, every Christian who, who lies will, will drop dead. Just our experience will tell us very different, uh, differently. But to me, it's almost like God was saying right at the beginning of the nation of Israel in the land of Canaan, and now again, right at the start uh, of the church in the New Testament, God needed to discipline uh, His people to tell them who He is and that they need to live holy. Some of the Old Testament pictures we find of the church or of the community of faith, uh, lessons that we can learn. We have the concept of uh, the people of God. God often refers to, his, to the nation of Israel as my people. Uh, if you go through the prophetic literature, it is always about my people. My people have turned their backs on me and God reaches out to them. He is in a covenant relationship with them. The concept of the nation of Israel and whether it's Judah or Zion uh, or Sometimes Jacob and other names and titles used for the nation. The flock of God in Jeremiah chapter 23. Uh, and even David, we know the psalm so well in Psalm 23 where he talks about God as my shepherd. Uh, if you turn it around, it means that the nation was the flock of God. And we have that picture where, where God cares for his flock. God's vineyard, uh, Isaiah chapter 5 is a, is a sad story because God said, I planted a vineyard, and he's referring to Israel, but, but they only produced thistles and thorns and so on. Uh, and so in that picture, we find God reaching out to his nation. He owns this vineyard, and he wanted them to grow and produce fruit for them. And you'll, you'll see some of these very same images being repeated in the New Testament, the image of Jesus as a shepherd and Jesus um, as, um, as the true vine and we are the branches, and so on. God's child. There is a, an, a, really one of my favorite pictures in the Old Testament we find in Ezekiel chapter 16. Uh, I'm not going to read it right now, but uh, please do yourself a favor and read it. God says something like, I was going down the road and I found Israel kicking in her blood, or in, his blo in her blood uh, next to the road is a baby. And I picked her up and I washed her and I raised her as my own. It's a beautiful picture of God coming in and being the parent, God being the father of this, uh, of this little baby and saving it from, from a certain death and adopting that child. And then these pictures clearly point to God's special relationship with us, but also His requirements. Uh, if I am His child, I need to obey my parent. If I am part of the flock, I need to follow the shepherd. Uh, if I'm part of God's nation, I, I need to live for the glory of God, and so we can continue. There is a promised future in the Old Testament, though, um, and we've seen this also again and again, always referring forward to uh, Jesus. Two weeks ago we looked at that. Last week we looked at the, the, the Old Testament picture, looking at the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so the harmonious and holy community, the people of God, those who were set apart for God, 
was constantly marred by sin and rebellion. Uh, I'm actually sometimes very horrified when I read through the Old Testament uh, books of uh, kings and chronicles, and I see how far some of the kings, the nation of Israel, have drifted from God, serving the Asherah um, uh, gods and, and Asterahs and, and, and uh, the Baals and all those, and poles and idols and statutes and heights and all sorts of different things that they have established, neglecting the temple. And so, the, the, the ideal picture is obviously not in the Old Testament. Um, and therefore the Old Testament clearly points to a time and it anticipates a time that was going to come in the future when God's people will live in harmony with Himself. God's people will live in harmony uh, with one another in a loving and a caring community where they will look after each other and bring glory to God. The Old Testament also alluded to the fact that this new community will be made up of more than just Israel. Now, unfortunately, Israel simply claimed the promises for themselves. But, but again and again, you find, especially in the prophetic literature, you find references to more than just Israel. And it was always God's intention, which uh, Israel failed to accomplish. Uh, and that was to include other nations in the people of God. So there is a, a future promise where God was going to extend uh, His people into the other nations. From the Old Testament, we move into the New Testament. We're talking about the community of New Testament believers. There's um, the dawn of a new day, the day of God's salvation plan that came to fulfillment in the birth of Jesus Christ the Messiah. God laid the foundation in the Old Testament era by establishing a nation, His nation, the nation of Israel, the people of God. The New Testament church is therefore a continuation. And I want you to be very, um, uh, to, to listen carefully to my language. It's not replacing Israel. And oftentimes people say uh, that, that some theologians have a replacement theology, and that is Israel no longer counts for anything, and that the church has replaced Israel. Now, my personal view on that is that, that Israel was not replaced by the church, but the church is a continuation of what God was doing in the Old Testament. And it's in a certain sense the culmination of what God was doing in the Old Testament. There's a huge debate around the position of Israel and what will happen to Israel somewhere in the future. And good, solid Christians hold different views on that. And, and uh, it's not our, our time tonight to talk about that, but when we talk about the second coming uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we may be uh, alluding to that as well. But the Old Testament gives high priority uh, to the creation of a, a God community. Uh, in the Old Testament, and now in the New Testament, that dream is brought to fulfillment. Jesus is the one around whom we find that community because Jesus is now our high priest. He is our sacrifice. He is the one who uh, atones for us or toned for us. He is still interceding for us. And in Jesus, we find commonality. And when Jesus prayed, his high priestly, priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he prayed for the unity and he said, Father, as you and I are one, I pray for these disciples of mine. And then he says, I don't just pray for them. I pray for all those who will believe as a result of their ministry. I pray that they will be one as we are one. So in Jesus, we find that unity and that dream come to uh, fulfillment. The final chapter in the God story, the final stroke on the canvas will be the consummation of the new community, one without sin, where we live in perfect harmony with God. We'll talk a little bit more about heaven and what heaven will look like uh, in, a, in a few weeks' time. Uh, but right now, I think that is enough to know that we're going to live in complete harmony with God uh, and that we will uh, therefore be part of what God's final plan or alter, uh, initial plan and final plan uh, will be like. When we talk about Jesus and the church, as Jesus started his public ministry, he called 12 apostles to be with him. Um, and that's the beginning of this new community. I think the selection of the 12 apostles, 12 disciples whom Jesus eventually called apostles, uh, is a clear indication of the continuation that God was still dealing in the number 12. Um, and whether that has any significance in terms of the exact number and so on, I personally believe the symbolic um, 
uh, significance of that is that, that Jesus was here to prove that God started something and he is continuing to do that same thing. And the 24 elders in the book of Revelation is proof of the fact that both Old and New Testament uh, people are represented in the presence of God. Other disciples, of course, joined the 12. In fact, before they were even appointed, there were many other disciples. Uh, we, we learn of um, a number, 70 or 72 uh, in the Bible, in the New Testament Gospels. We learn about um, multitudes of people who came around Jesus. And we also learn about, about 100 or 120 who were in the upper room after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. So there were others around, but the 12 uh, apostles uh, play a very significant role, a symbolic role. And so that even when Judas uh, betrayed Jesus um, and he, he hanged himself, in Acts chapter 1 we find the apostle saying, we have to find a replacement. There, there needs to be 12 of us. There needs to be this complete figure or um, number. So Jesus' intention was that his disciples would be formed into a community and that they would extend the fellowship to other people and nations as well. Matthew 28 uh, 18 to 20, very, very clear. We call it the Great Commission, where Jesus says to his disciples, go into all the world, go and make disciples, he says, and baptize them and teach them uh, to do everything that I have taught you uh, to do. And in Acts chapter 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses uh, here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we're going to look more specifically at that command uh, next week. Uh, but Jesus himself only used the word church, uh, the word ecclesia in Greek, only twice. And both of those occasions in Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, 18, and in Matthew chapter 18, verse 17. So, uh, but when you come to the book of, of, uh, of Acts, then the word is used, uh, generally speaking, for the church, the gathering of believers. And when Paul wrote to different people, to different churches. That's, that's the word he uses when he writes to the church in Ephesus, the church in Rome, or wherever. That is the word that he is using. When you look at the disciples, and I've alluded to this already, the early apostles and the disciples had no hesitation in starting a fellowship of believers. Um, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached and uh, about 3,000 people came to know the Lord, they were immediately added to the number. In fact, that's the wording used. They were added to the number on that day. A little bit later on, you read about the number has now grown to 5,000. So somehow, and we, we're not told exactly how, but they were, they were counted. There was some kind of an order. We find a little bit of a disorder uh, in Acts chapter 6 when uh, some of the Greek-speaking widows are complaining that they are not receiving the same attention as the uh, Aramaic-speaking widows. And again, some order needed to be uh, uh, introduced into the church, and they appointed the seven, uh, whom we believe to be uh, the deacons, uh, ultimately. But it tells us in the book of Acts how the apostles, the early disciples, went out and, that, and they, they did nothing but plant churches. And that's exactly what they did. They, it took them a little while to start realizing that they needed to include other nations. But ultimately, when it did happen, Acts chapter 10 tells us about Peter and the vision. And he went to the house of Cornelius in uh, Caesarea. And as he preached the gospel, um, then they received the Holy Spirit and they became Christians. Uh, and when you go to the city of Antioch in chapter 11 of the book of Acts, then you find the nucleus of people there are actually Gentiles. So by that time, the switch has already started taking place. By the time the apostle Paul comes onto the scene and he is appointed as a missionary in Acts chapter 13, from that point on, you find them moving into the Gentile world and uh, they are planting churches around the world. And that's precisely what... Uh, the Apostle Paul was doing. He was planting churches. And oftentimes we talk about evangelism as saving souls. I don't think the Apostle Paul was interested in saving souls as much as he was interested in planting churches. Now, and, it, and of course those churches are made up of Christians. And that's an important thing to remember. Now, when you turn to uh, um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, here is an Old Testament picture that is applied to the New Testament. And Peter is saying, but you, and he's primarily speaking to Gentiles, because if you go back to the first chapter, it says, to God's elect, 
strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And these were all um, provinces of modern-day Turkey. So we're talking about an area far, far north of Judea. When he talks to them, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's a beautiful Old Testament picture where Peter talks about being priests and kings and um, a prophetic ministry uh, to proclaim the Word of God. And so he's using the Old Testament picture but making a direct application to the New Testament church. So when we talk about the church in history, we, um, we start in the book of Acts really when we talk about uh, Christianity and uh, the establishing of churches in almost every country since then for the past 2,000 years or more. Uh, and it bears witness to the fact that the church is here to stay. Uh, interesting to note, um, uh, there, there is a, a day of prayer for the persecuted church. And even till today, people are being persecuted around the world. In fact, about 100 million Christians apparently are being persecuted somehow or the other. Um, but if you turn back the clock to the first and the second century and the third century in particular, the church Christians were heavily persecuted to the point where some leaders around the world tried to annihilate Christianity. I'm busy reading a book on the Ottoman uh, Empire right now in preparation for a trip to Turkey. And um, it is fascinating to read how they have viewed Christianity. Now, of course, the brand of Christianity that they were very familiar with was either the, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church or the Greek Orthodox Church, which those were relatively close to them. But even the European version and the Byzantium or the Byzantine uh, Empire uh, created a picture of Christianity in their minds of big churches and mosaic and um, all sorts of paintings on the walls. And that's the version of Christianity. But they hated it and they, they tried to exterminate and extinguish every Christian and the, most of the slaves. And they took hundreds and hundreds of thousands of slaves during their time. And most of them came from the so-called Christian nations. Um, and today when you go to Turkey, the sad thing now is that there are almost no Christians in Turkey. Um, they're 98% Muslim. And whether it's active Muslim or secular Muslim, the whole country now is Muslim. And that was the stronghold of Christianity. Even throughout uh, the time of the Ottoman regime, um, there were many, many Christians and they, they lived in Turkey and it was one of the strongholds uh, of Christianity for many years. But despite major opposition to the church, those it internal difficulties that I referred to earlier on, sin that is found among uh, its members, the divisions and the setbacks that the church experienced over many, many years, uh, false teachings, going off on a tangent, uh, not serving God the way they should, there's no doubt that the church is the way that God wants to work in this era that we live in. God's blessing is upon the church, and uh, otherwise the church would not have survived. We would not have had, we would not have seen the revivals that we have uh, evidence of in history if it wasn't for God protecting His church throughout all the ages. And here we are, 2,000 years later after Jesus died, and the church is strong, the church is growing. We wish it would grow even more, but it, uh, we'll look at, at some of the stats uh, next week. Um, but the church in the world is still strong. Some of the biblical truths about the church, the nature, the character, the mission, and the makeup of the church as we, um, as we look at the study we call ecclesiology. When we talk about membership of the church, now true membership of the church is restricted to those who know Jesus Christ. A little bit later I'll introduce you to another concept, and that's the church universal and the church local. The church universal is what I referred to right at the beginning, and that is the church of Jesus Christ. Anybody and everybody around the world who belongs to Jesus Christ is part of the body of Jesus Christ. And only those people really make up the membership of the church. Now, how that pans out and how that is applied in local churches, that is a different story, and it creates some of the differences between uh, churches as well. 
And churches have different ways of determining whether a person is a true believer or not. Uh, in some churches, um, and I'll just mention it without making any comment about that, but in some churches, uh, a baby is born into the church, christened by the parents or brought to um, the head of the church, whether it's a priest or a pastor or whoever, to be christened, uh, and then brought up in the ways of God. And at some point in time, uh, either through catechism or some classes, uh, there is confirmation and the belief that, that that particular process will help the child and ultimately the young adult to be a Christian. And then that's the only way in which you can become part of the, the church. You don't have a person just walking in from the street and saying, I'm part of the church. There is a process. Other churches believe that people need to come to repentance. Uh, they need to repent before God of their sin. They need to confess their sin. They need to uh, uh, say that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. They, they have a conversion experience. Um, and then uh, different churches apply baptism differently as far as that is concerned. And then through an interview, in most of these cases, through an interview or the completion of a form, it is then determined that this person is a true a Christian and therefore can belong to our church. And so we'll talk about some of the differences also uh, a little bit later on. As I said, different churches may apply different standards or requirements for membership, uh, such as determining whether the person is a true Christian or some churches will not accept a person unless the person has been baptized one way or the other. Uh, and there are many different uh, application or membership application procedures that are followed. So that's in terms of membership. When we talk about the sacraments or the ordinances, I think this is well known to us. The word sacrament from the Latin word sacramentum is used to refer to, uh, and this is a quote from Milne, an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. I have received God's forgiveness, and Jesus has given us these sacraments or ordinances so that we can express it symbolically to, to uh, claim that we belong to Him. S and some traditions prefer the word uh, ordinances. Uh, I know in Baptist circles they prefer the word ordinance rather than sacrament uh, because primarily, um, or in, in, in some other circles, like in the Roman Catholic Church, it has significance and through the taking of the sacraments my relationship with God is established. My sins are forgiven by the taking of the sacrament and so on. But Jesus gave two. The one is communion uh, or the Lord's Supper, and the other one is baptism. And uh, we are going to talk about those uh, also very briefly. When, when we look at the significance of the sacraments, um, they are outward expressions of an inner relationship with Christ. Uh, and in some cases, if it is infant baptism, for example, it is a, a sacrament applied to a child or to a baby with the wish and the prayer and the hope that the child will ultimately act upon that promise that has been made uh, by the parents. But they confirm, these sacraments or ordinances confirm the fact that our sins have been forgiven um, or the, it's the hope that our sins will be forgiven. I prefer the, the first one and that is that my sins have been forgiven. They symbolize our identification with Christ in His death and resurrection, confirming that really only true Christians participate. We don't go out into the world and serve communion to every uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry. We, we want to make sure that people are Christians and that they, they believe in Jesus Christ. And they also celebrate the, what I call the true benefits of being a Christian. Those benefits are plenty. I'm, I'm adopted into God's family. I've been forgiven. Uh, I've been given peace. I have assurance of salvation. And every time... For example, when I take communion, then these benefits are affirmed and confirmed in my life. And I go through the same exercise again. I, I pray, Lord, I have sinned against you and I want you to forgive on an ongoing basis, forgive my sin. So they celebrate those benefits for us. When it comes to when and how often we do the sacraments or apply the sacraments, baptism is an initiation rite, R-I-T, uh, R-I-T-E. And therefore, baptism is only applied once uh, in the Christian's life. It is uh, for the person who begins this walk with Christ. And we'll talk about the differences in baptism or the application of baptism uh, also a little bit later on. Now, whether it's applied to a baby or to a person who has made that decision on his or her own, 
uh, it is only administered once to that person, uh, either with the hope that the child, the baby, will become a Christian, or it is applied to the person who has made a confession of faith uh, in Jesus Christ. The communion service, however, is different. It's also referred to as the Lord's Supper. Uh, in um, some uh, circles, it's referred to as the Eucharist. Uh, Eucharist is a word that means thanksgiving. Uh, and uh, it is a continuous act of remembrance. And Jesus even told us, uh, do this as often as you remember me, as often as you think about me. And when you do it, you do it in remembrance of me, and which is why uh, communion is, is, uh, is, is celebrated on a more uh, regular basis. A couple of the differences around sacraments. Most Protestant churches accept only these two sacraments. However, at the Council of Trent in 1545, it lasted until 1563, the Roman Catholic Church identified and accepted seven sacraments, adding two baptism and communion, penance, priestly ordination, marriage, confirmation, extreme unction ministered to the dying. And so those are additional sacraments. Uh, but the Protestant Reformation split the church again. And uh, most Protestants will believe that, that only those two, baptism and communion, uh, must be uh, celebrated. Now, we're going to take a, a break, a little break, and then when we come back, we'll talk about baptism and communion and some of the differences among churches uh, around that. Okay, we're looking at the two ordinances or two sacraments, communion and baptism. Uh, I guess even as we sit in this room today, we have differences of opinion when it comes to baptism. We've been exposed to differences of different, different kinds of teachings uh, around baptism. There are two major forms of baptism. The one is infant baptism, also referred to as pedo-baptism or christening. Um, both of those terms uh, would be uh, acceptable. And this is when Christians, uh, parent, Christian parents, bring their newborn, almost like Israel brought, brought their newborn boys to be circumcised uh, in that sense, in the same way Christian parents bring their children, uh, their babies, and it replaces circumcision. It's a continuation of circumcision in the Old Testament. Um, and baptism takes place by sprinkling on the forehead and is sometimes described as one of the characteristics of the covenant, the so-called covenant theology. The whole reasoning here is going back to God's covenant with Abraham. And that is, if you have a son, you need to bring the son on the eighth day and your son needs to be circumcised. And that is the sign of the covenant. So from a New Testament perspective, um, the, it, the baptism has replaced circumcision. is no longer a blood that flows. It's water that has replaced the physical cutting uh, of the foreskin. And it also now is opened up to both genders, uh, girls and boys. So it's no longer restricted to boys only. But in the same way that Abraham would have brought his child, and now the child is accepted within the covenant of God in the same way parents bring the child, and uh, baptism ensures that that child is now within the covenant. Now, those who oppose that view or ha hold a different view say that baptism needs to take place upon confession of faith of the individual who makes the choice by him or herself. And that's the major difference. And then, of course, the baptism is normally done by full immersion, although even there are differences. Uh, sometimes it's by pouring water, uh, and, and there are uh, baptism upon confession of faith that takes place by, by um, sprinkling of water. But um, the major way in which this is happening around the world, uh, churches who believe in uh, baptism by Im immersion, sometimes referred to as adult baptism, which is not a, a happy reference necessarily because there's no age restriction. Uh, I've seen children being baptized in this way uh, as well. Uh, but then they are of an age where they know exactly what they're doing, and with their, uh, the help of their parents, uh, it has been established that they are Christians. And so those are the two major views uh, when it comes to uh, baptism um, among uh, Protestant churches. The differences around communion, it is also referred to as the Lord's Table. Uh, 
uh, or the Eucharist, and I've referred to the Lord's Supper before. And the different churches or traditions differ on the frequency of communion. Uh, if you're in a brethren-type church, you would have had communion every single Sunday. Whenever there's a gathering of believers, then they have communion. Uh, and in other churches, like uh, here in South Africa, the, the Dutch Reformed Church traditionally only had it once a quarter, uh, because that's when the ox wagon could make it to the town, and it, became, it literally became communion weekend, um, and so on. Uh, and that's the only time that some of those farmers ever got to church uh, on, those, on that one single occasion. Um, and so churches differ in this regard. Some have it once a month. Uh, they may do it um, once in the morning, once in the evening. Uh, and as I said to you, it happens monthly, quarterly, or weekly. And then also the meaning of the elements. Do the bread and the wine symbolize, that is, point to the blood and the body of Jesus, or does it actually become the body and the blood of Jesus? And in your uh, Roman Catholic and Anglican traditions, uh, the blood and the, uh, or rather the bread and the cup, become the blood of Jesus and so on. So that, those things cannot be handled by anybody else, and it must be consumed in totality, uh, otherwise uh, you go against the blood and the body of Jesus. And Protestants disagree on that particular issue. But the participants of communion, um, that's another thing where we, uh, where we differ, or churches differ, and that is, do we control who takes communion? Um, there are some church traditions that I'm very familiar with uh, where they control it, and only if you are a member of the church and you can sort of half prove it, then you're allowed to, do, to partake in the communion. Others are far more lenient, and there would be an open invitation saying, if you know Jesus, and we're not going to come and check with you and tick it off with everybody, but if you know Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, you can participate in the communion. And then the qualifications of the person who uh, is leading or serving the elements, and in many traditions, only uh, an ordained pastor can do that, or a priest can serve that. Whereas other traditions will say, no, but we believe in the priesthood of all believers, and therefore anybody can serve the communion. Uh, so you have these differences of opinion. I'm not going to uh, debate this uh, with you, because I believe even here we have the differences of opinion. I simply want to introduce you to those different uh, opinions. When it comes to the church's calling and mission, uh, leaving the sacraments or the ordinances, uh, the church's role in this world is to extend the kingdom of God. And we do it in many, many different ways. And different churches, depending on their resources, uh, depending on their calling and, and their convictions, may do it differently. But sharing the good news with people within the, your sphere of influence, it's normally referred to as, as evangelism. The church's role is to tell the world that Jesus died and that people can become Christians if they believe in Jesus Christ, that their sins can be forgiven. We call it evangelism. We call it sharing the good news, proclaiming the good news, or any one of those terms. Uh, but that's one, one calling on the church. And if a church does not do this, then they are not uh, fulfilling the calling of God upon them. Sharing the gospel with people from other cultures around the world and next week we'll talk more about this particular concept, um, which is evangelism on the one hand and missions or mission on the other side. Um, oftentimes referred to as foreign missions, and that is when a church sends missionaries uh, to other cultures around the world that can be close by or far away, and uh, sharing the gospel with those people is called missions. Creating a community where God is glorified and His love is experienced, it's our calling to be a community, we call that a redemptive community, where people can be, uh, where they can be accepted, where they, where they can experience their forgiveness of sins. Now, the church can never forgive sins. And this is another major difference between Protestants and, and Roman Catholics oftentimes. The, as, as Protestants, we believe we don't forgive sins. I don't declare you, uh, your sins are forgiven. But I can be instrumental in ministering to you the, the forgiveness of God, and that is sharing the gospel with you, helping you to confess your sins and then repent before God, and your sins are forgiven based on the truth in God's word. But in the church, is, we create a community where we experience that forgiveness and we live as forgiven people. Well, that's at least the ideal that we talked about earlier on. And also in the church, we are a caring and a forgiving, loving, 
redemptive community where people can experience God's healing. And the healing may be an inner healing. It may be healing of, of issues in my past. It can even be physical healing. Uh, because in this redemptive community, God wants us to live as His children. When it comes to leadership within the church, there are also different uh, ways in which we look at that. When we, look, when we go to the Bible, it indicates clearly that all Christians are members of the body of Jesus Christ, and we are equal before God. Um, it doesn't matter our background, our social standing, our gender, or our education. We, before God, we are equal. Some people refer to that as the, the uh, ground in, uh, before the cross is level. Uh, there, there are no steps. No, no person is higher up before the cross than any other person. But at the same time, we also recognize that God has given the church uh, some leaders. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, where Paul is very clear on this particular issue, and he calls it gifts that Jesus gave uh, as he ascended to heaven. He gave uh, gifts to the church. Uh, he says, it is he, he who ascended, the one who came down but ascended, it is he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And so the, the fact that there is leadership is very seldom denied by, by Christians. The way leadership is applied and the kind of leadership we appoint in churches, that is where many churches disagree with one another. The traditional distinction between what has become known as the laity and the clergy uh, is something that we really should try and get out of our minds altogether. Because we believe in the priesthood of all believers. There's no special class for some people uh, because they, they are either learned or they have some qualification or uh, they have been appointed to a certain position. Um, but having said that, it doesn't mean that we don't believe in leadership either. So uh, it, there's a bit of a tension here. On the one hand, it's all equal. On the other hand, uh, we do believe that God has appointed leaders. Now, churches differ on this issue of leadership and how it applies in a local church. And we refer to that as church polity. Not politics, but polity. And the word polity means the way decisions are made in a local church. Um, and it comes with different variations. When we talk about a Presbyterian style of leadership, we're not only referring to Presbyterian churches, although they are one example of this. And the word presbyteros means an overseer or an elder. And the decisions in a church are made by the elders. We talk about elder-led churches. Uh, where the elders make all or most of the decisions in a church. Most of the independent charismatic churches in South Africa and around the world operate along these lines. There's an eldership. The elders appoint elders, um, and there are, different, there are kind of several varieties of this. But that's a big grouping of churches we call Presbyterian in style. Others are congregational in style of decision-making Churches like Baptists and obviously, as the name suggests, uh, Congregationalists uh, they, or Congregational Churches, they believe that the final authority rests with the congregation. And therefore, they have membership meetings where the members come together, the members nominate for elders, the, the, the members finally make a decision by bringing out their vote. Um, it's not a full-blown democracy but it has very similar principles to that of a dem democracy, uh, a political democracy. And then there is Episcopalian. And that really means that there is a bishop, not necessarily local. Uh, some local churches will have a bishop, but outside of the local church, as a grouping of local churches, there will be a head. And that person is oftentimes referred to as a bishop. And the word episkopos means a bishop in the Greek word. Uh, decisions are made by a regional or national leadership structures. Um, sometimes there is a synod uh, that would get together and they would make decisions. Um, and, and it's an outside body, outside of the local church. And those decisions are binding uh, on uh, the local churches. Typical examples are Anglicans, uh, Lutheran uh, churches, and Methodist churches as well, uh, by and large. And then the Roman Catholic as a... 
maybe as a big grouping, you could include in here Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. Uh, they are of very similar kind of style, where there is a final, where the final authority rests with an individual, such as in the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope in Rome. And there's a whole hierarch hierarchical structure, but, but ultimately, if there's a final, final decision to be made, then the Pope can make the decision, or the Patriarch, or whatever that tradition uh, may be. So those are big groupings of churches in terms of leadership style. What is the task of leadership? Here is a quote from Kevin Roy. God has appointed men of maturity and experience to keep watch over God's flock as good shepherds. The terms elders, overseers, and shepherds are all synonyms for the exact same office, the office of leadership. To the elders of the church of Ephesus, Paul said uh, in Acts chapter 20, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. And in this quotation in Acts 20, we see all three terms used in reference to the same men, those who were called to lead and guide the church in Ephesus. There seems to be only really two offices, uh, leadership positions in the church when we go to the New Testament. The one is that of elders, and there are a bunch of synonyms. Uh, the word bishop in the, in the Greek means exactly the same thing. Shepherds and overseers, um, and the quote from Kevin Roy sort of proved that same thing. And their main responsibility is that of uh, spiritual oversight, uh, shepherding the flock, making sure the teaching is correct, uh, caring for the flock, um, and, and, and helping people to grow in their faith. And then, if we go back to Acts chapter 6, we believe that those laid the foundations for what ultimately in the pastoral epistles in, in Timothy and Titus became the, the, the office of deacon. Um, and, and that had a more practical role. Looking after the, the widows, for example, uh, was what happened in Acts chapter 6. And it seems like deacons have in our modern society the role of looking after the property uh, the finances and making some of those practical kinds of decisions. But when you go to the New Testament, it seems like only these two uh, operate very strongly. In addition to that, one can add that perhaps there is an apostolic role. I want you to v be very careful with the language here because um, churches in the past in history have gone, uh, and even today, have gone in a major wrong direction when they start appointing apostles. When you start appointing apostles, and we have versions of churches like that even here in South Africa where they have literally 12 apostles, and those apostles rule, and they are the final authority. And they hear from God, and they bring the message of God. And so I'm personally very careful when it comes to this. I would say that some people may have an apostolic type ministry where they have, where they have input and some authority over some local churches uh, with their approval and by their invitation to come and minister to them and into their situation. But I would be very, very careful to appoint apostles and make them into some kind of a special brand. The marks of a true, a true church. Those kept the church uh, theologians busy for many years. How do you know that a church is a real true church? Well, um, there are many different uh, ways in which that can be looked at. But the reformers really came up with mainly two, and that is correct preaching, and they called it the proclamation of the Word of God. When the Bible is proclaimed in its fullness and in its truth, then you have true church. That is one uh, sign or mark, and another one when you celebrate the sacraments, and that is baptism and communion. And they said those two made up the marks of a true church. Some reformers added to that the exercise of discipline. In other words, there's got to be some boundaries in the church. You don't just allow the whole world to join your church and there's no discipline and everybody can live whichever way they like. There's got to be some form of discipline because we serve a holy God. We can add other marks such as unity, uh, purity, and the exercise of discipline, as I said. What is the church doing? Uh, what are some of the activities of a church? Well, worship is one of them. I personally hold a very broad definition of worship, which I want to explain to you on the board uh, just very briefly. I believe 
an illustration is that of my marriage. Now, as I'm standing here with you today, I'm actually married. Um, but I'm, I, I do it in layers, I would say. I'm never unmarried, but I'm not always that close to Joan, my wife. That's her name. Now, there are times when I move on these circles away from her physically, but I, I continue to be married. But there are times when I get home. Now, right now, I'm, I'm teaching over here, perhaps, um, and, and I'm, I'm in this sort of circle right here. In other words, I'm far away from her. I may even be traveling around the world, but I remain married. And I may move closer to home, be with a family. There we may have a, a, a supper, and Joan and I may be chatting a little bit. And then there are times when Joan and I are very intimate. But at all times, I am married. But the way we relate differs depending on how intimate we are. Now, I see worship in exactly the same way. And that is, I, all, I worship all the time. I may be working, but I'm focusing on my work. I may be working on my car or driving somewhere or having a vacation or holiday or whatever. Um, there are times when I think about God. I may be praying throughout the day about, uh, to God. And then there are times when I go to church, and there are times when I'm very, very intimate and close uh, to God. And, and that, in my opinion, is the definition of worship. And to some extent, the church facilitates that worship. Now, the church, when we gather, we are worshiping, and that is not just the music and the singing. When the word is preached, when the offering is taken, when the announcements are made, when we pray, all of those can be seen as worship. Now, there are times when you feel a lot closer to God, just as in a marriage. You may feel more intimate in your relationship. But in the same way, I believe the church is helping and facilitating and all of that. In fact, when I look at this model, my worship experience, which is more intimate, let's say on a Sunday, helps me to survive when I work. I'm still worshiping, but my worship is, is, is now an extended part of worship. I'm further away from the intimacy with God, but it doesn't mean that I've left God or that God has left me. I'm still worshiping. And it, um, it has revolutionized my understanding of worship and the way I try to live my life every day. Now, the church is also reaching out. Uh, we talked about this and we'll talk about this in, in detail next week. We reach out into the community and into the communities around us. In fact, the church, part of the church is tasked to reach out into the world, uh, literally around the world. And we'll give far more attention to that next week. The church is also a praying church. You find the church praying in the New Testament, uh, prayer is a major part of our worshiping of God, uh, where we approach Him in adoration and, and also in intercession and praying, um, and whether we pray for the needs within our community or within our church, uh, the church is addressing God. And taking care of members' needs is the caring part. Uh, Acts chapter 6, again, if I can refer to that, where the seven were appointed, and several other places where we need to love one another, take care of one another, be hospitable to one another, uh, it's part of the church. The church is there to take care of one another's needs as well. Some of the theological images I've referred to one of this before, and that's the local and the universal church, as well as the visible and the invisible. Uh, the Reformers came up with these distinctions to help us understand that the church of Jesus is everywhere. Now, every person in the world who belongs to Jesus is part of the invisible church. We can't always place our finger on it. We can't always point to a particular person to say he or she belongs to the church or not. If you're in a Muslim country and it's illegal to serve Jesus, you may be a secret believer. You may worship Jesus underground. Now, we can't go around and try and say uh, all those who are Christians come to the front or come to the fore uh, because that's dangerous to do that. So only God in this sense, and this is the distinction that the reformers made, only God knows who belongs to the church, and that's invisible. However, the, the church ultimately needs to become visible as well. We, all, we can't all just be invisible um, because the, the, the church has a, a face. It has people. Uh, people make up the church, and it, in that sense, it is visible. And that's what we experience, and that may be the church on the corner type thing. And the same thing applies to local and universal. The church is universal. It includes people around the world and in all ages, but the church is also local, and that is the local XYZ church on the corner 
and that is where people come together to worship Jesus. Not, not the church building, but the church as you identify the different people with a name and some boundaries around the church. Some of the New Testament images, uh, there are plenty of them, and we can learn so much from them. Um, if we talk about the family of God in 1 Timothy chapter 5, the body of Jesus Christ, uh, probably the most well-known analogy that Paul is using uh, for the church. Uh, in Ephesians 5, as well as in Revelation 19 and, and 21, we, we learn that the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. And we, uh, we learn in 1 Corinthians 3 that it's the place where Paul, uh, as a minister, felt that he was working in the field of God. In the same context, he talks about the building or the temple of God. And then the holy priesthood in, in 1 uh, Peter chapter 2 uh, also in verse, uh, cha verse 5 and verse 9. And then we're branches on a vine. And then the list goes on. There. We, we, shep we, we are being shepherded. We are part of a flock. Uh, and the list is long in terms of the number of images of the New Testament. Just a word on the New Testament. I'm sure you have heard it preached before. We've got to get back to the New Testament church. Now where do you turn to when you go and look for the New Testament church? Well, more often than not, people turn to Acts chapter 2, and they say, this is God's ideal for a church. Now, I am not arguing uh, against the principles that we find in Acts chapter 2, but I, have, I want to take issue with the fact that I don't think this is the only church or the New Testament church. It's an example of a New Testament kind of church. But this church who was so wonderful at this stage, they were selling their stuff, having everything in common. They met together in, in the temple courts. They broke bread. They ate together. They were praising God. They enjoyed the favor of the people. The Lord added to their number. And I've preached on this, and I've heard many sermons on this. And, and more often than not, I was saying, we've got to get back to this ideal. Now, as much as that is an ideal, this New Testament church in Jerusalem also had many faults and problems and sins, like racism. They would not allow a Gentile into that community, not by Acts chapter 2. It, and, and they had major difficulty, even when Peter had a vision, they had major difficulty to allow those people in, into their community. And so that became an ongoing struggle uh, with them. There was sin in the, in the persons of uh, Ananias and Sapphira that they had to deal with in Acts chapter 5. And in the same way, you can say that other churches in the New Testament were plagued by sin in the same way. For, uh, Corinthians, for example, the church in Corinth, was, uh, was not the best example of what an ideal church really should be like. And so my approach to that is, we need to look at all of the Old Testament, all of the New Testament, and then gain from that uh, the principles, or glean from that the principles, the guidelines that will help us understand what it is what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ or call it the New Testament church. I want to take a very brief uh, look, and I mentioned this to you before, uh, a look at the church in history and into the world. Uh, what I've just done up to this point in time is, is, is talking about the theology of church. What is it that we believe about church and how do churches operate and how do different churches see the things in different ways. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But when you go through the history of the church, and I'll have to, to really just hit the high, highlights over here, the book of Acts tells us of the spreading of Christianity in the known world, ending with Paul freely proclaiming the gospel in Rome, Acts chapter 28. When we study the New Testament, that's one of the things we looked at. Initially, there were no known separations between churches, uh, problems for sure. But you had no a church of this and a church of that or this kind of denomination. And in other words, we didn't have any denominations in the early church. That is something that happened later on as the church developed. Um, they had many differences uh, and, um, and, and issues, but they experienced a level of, a, a level of unity that is unsurpassed in, in, our, in, in church history, literally from that point on. In those days, says Kevin Roy, uh, the entire Christian community was essentially united, enjoying mutual fellowship and communion despite internal tensions and conflicts. Now, the first three centuries introduced the persecution. The Christian community was a minority religion, a total minority uh, in Judaism initially, but also in the pagan world as they started reaching out. They formed uh, just a small little community. And they were 
persecuted by both the Roman officials and by the Jews and, and, and oftentimes by pagan people. And then in a dramatic turn of events, Constantine uh, became a Christian or at least adopted the Christian faith. Uh, scholars are not all in agreement whether he became a true born-again Christian or whether he simply adopted the Christian faith. And that turned the whole history around like you cannot believe it. He actually moved from Rome and made um, Byzantium, uh, which is modern-day Istanbul, the capital of, of the Roman Empire, and established a very, very strong Christian community uh, in what he then called Constantinople, uh, naming it after himself. But it almost made Christianity the, the only legally sanctioned religion of the empire by the year 400. And from that time on, we had a very, the very strong influence of uh, the Byzantine era for years, for another thousand years or so almost, uh, until uh, Islam uh, took over that whole region. The growth in depth and insight, the 4th and the 5th century saw a grappling with many issues that we have already looked at. Uh, the person of Jesus, who he was, uh, the Holy Spirit and how he operates, the Trinity, uh, the church, how do we define that, the Bible, the canon of the, of the scriptures, all of those things happened throughout the years prior to that, but they came to a head during the, the 4th and the 5th centuries. Um, and it was at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, the middle of the 5th century, that church leaders reached consensus on many of the issues around Jesus Christ, his nature, his person, and so on. And it became known as the Catholic Church. Now, the word Catholic here means general, not Roman Catholic, as ultimately it became. Uh, but initially it was simply the Catholic Church, which is the general church or the universal church. A big division came, uh, a much greater division in Christendom uh, came with the split between East and West in the 11th century. And this is a quote from Kevin Roy's notes. Even before that time, the growing political and cultural separation between the Latin West and the Greek East had put strains on Christian unity. There were many, many causes, but major disagreements about the role of the papacy. In other words, whether uh, the whole world needs to be subject to Rome and to the Pope in Rome or not, and the, the East would not accept that. Uh, and then the wording of the Nicene Creed. Now, we looked at the Nicene Creed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it caused the separation between the Eastern and the Western traditions. Today, it exists in mainly the Roman Catholic Church representing the West, and then the Greek and, and Russian Orthodox churches representing the East. And those two traditions are, are pretty strong still uh, in the world today. And then, of course, the Reformation introduced another major split in Christianity. And that happened in the 16th century and onwards, uh, people such as Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, Ulrich Zwingli, uh, and others who came from uh, Germany and Switzerland, and it spread around Europe uh, eventually. Their initial intention was not ever to break away, but to cause a reformation within the Roman Catholic Church. But since it, would, it was never going to happen ultimately, and it was primarily the followers of Martin Luther and others who broke away from the, from the Roman Catholic uh, Church. And uh, it caused a major split. And today we have uh, the, the Protestant movement, which is a big movement, still smaller than the Roman Catholic Church, but uh, still a, a very, very strong movement uh, around the world. And the interesting thing is that the church is growing by division. Uh, that's the sad reality right now. The Protestant movement experienced uh, the proliferation of churches and groups. A uh, quote from Kevin Roy in the 17th century England, the quest for a more consistently reformed church based on biblical principles led to the separation of Presbyterians and Congregationalists from the Anglicans, uh, breaking away, and then to the separation of the Baptists from the Congregationalists, and in the 18th century, the evangelical awakening in England led to the separation of Methodists from the Anglicans. And then the beginning of the 20th century, we had a major Pentecostal revival. And that led to not only the Pentecostal movement, but out of the Pentecostal movement came the charismatic independent church movement, which is massive today. 
um, in the um, Latin America and many parts of Africa and Asia, the Pentecostal movement and charismatic movement is massive. Um, and, and so the list goes on and more and more breaks and breaking away and um, splits are happening. The groupings and denominations in general, uh, if you want to put them over against one another today uh, in Christianity, it's Roman Catholicism uh, over against Protestantism. Uh, you could also divide between evangelicals on the one hand and liberal theologians or churches on the other. And then there are more traditional type churches uh, as opposed to Pentecostal charismatic churches. You have large denominations such as Presbyterian, Methodist, uh, uh, Baptist and so on. And then the independent churches. And the independent church movement is, is really uh, moving fast. And then you have mainstream and marginal. Now, in the marginal section, it may even be sectarian. Um, and you're talking about Jehovah's Witness and Mormons, uh, Mormons and, and that sort of thing. Uh, each of those groupings subdivide into multitude of different denominations. Um, so it's not uh, among the Protestants, for example, there would be a multiple uh, different kinds of uh, movements and churches. Why the differences? Well, uh, churches differ on, on many different fronts. They, they differ on whether we should include or exclude the, certain people. Uh, when do you include people into your membership or when do you exclude them? One of the most recent developments is the emergent church. Uh, and they are far more inclusive and in reaching out into the community and saying, let people just come into the church and once they're inside, then we, will, we have them uh, as a captive audience who will share the gospel with them. I, I'm putting it in simple terms, and then others are saying, no, 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 you, you can't have the world in the church. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to draw the lines and saying you, you've got to make a confession of faith before you come to Jesus and before you allow them into the church. So the inclusivity and exclusivity regarding membership is a big issue. Baptism, I've, I've referred to that. It's a major point of disagreement, whether it should be infant baptism or baptism on, upon confession of faith. Church polity, we talked about that. That's how decisions are made, um, and that brought in many of the differences. The treatment of laity and clergy, if you're a brethren, uh, you would say there is no such thing as a clergy. We're all equal. We're all ministers. Uh, and if you are in some of the more traditional churches, then, of course, there's a whole hierarchy and rank uh, of ministers all the way to the top. Approaches to evangelism and social outreach, it led to major disagreements, especially in the 60s and 70s, uh, which became known as a social gospel. Uh, we, we're just out there to minister to people. We, we're not sharing Jesus with them. We just need to bless them. That's all we need to do. Uh, and it led to the social gospel um, debate. And then the baptism and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it has led to major, major splits within the church uh, worldwide. Uh, people have different views on those particular issues. Some of the positive features of the church, um, the church is growing worldwide. There, there is no doubt that it is growth. Now, whether it keeps up with um, the growth in population is another issue, and we'll talk a bit about that uh, next week, next time. But there is more unity and cooperation today than there has ever been, not ever been, than there has been for years. And part of that is just the, the modern world movement. Part of that is actually negative. It's the, the new age, let's, let's accept and love everybody. Um, and and the, the urgency of missions uh, also is another thing that binds us together. And that is there's a world out there that needs to be reached. And therefore we can't, we can't fight one another. We, we, we need to fight the devil. We can't fight other Christians, I think is, is essentially what I'm saying. And there is much greater agreement among churches on core issues of Christianity, such as um, who Jesus is and what he came to do for us. Uh, there are plenty of things that can keep us apart and separate us, but there's also a lot that we agree on, those core issues that we talked about. There remain many threats to Christianity today, to, Christ, to the Christian unity. Um, the liberal approach, approach to Scripture is something that will break down our unity. I have no doubt in my mind if people take a liberal view of Scripture, ultimately we separate ways uh, because we feel strongly about certain uh, views of the Scripture, theological things uh, in the Bible. Some of the statistics, um, and it's pro probably a year or so old, give and take a few hundred or thousand or maybe a million or two, this one way or the other, 
but the Roman Catholic Church makes up about 1.130 million um, uh, with one hierarchically organized church worldwide acknowledging the uh, primacy of the Bishop of Rome or the Pope. And so that binds them together. But there are many, many different versions of Roman Catholicism. But the one thing that binds them together is their acknowledgement of the Pope in Rome and the position of Rome. And then independents and Protestants make up, um, let's say, 810 million people of various older and newer Protestant denominations. And then the Eastern Orthodox churches uh, make up about 253 million around the world. Um, and they are the one thing in common is that they recognize the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. Anglicans make up 83 million some 27 churches within the Anglican community. Major threat within the Anglican community, even right now as we speak, uh, around certain uh, liberal tendencies, around um, homosexualism, for example, and it, uh, it's really threatening the unity of the Anglican church right now around the world. Marginal Christians, uh, we're talking about 36 million people, probably uh, referring to Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, uh, and, and many other sectarian groups. We would call them marginal uh, because we don't see them as really part of the mainstream of uh, Christianity. Some of the wrong views uh, as we look at the church. Uh, one view is that church membership is not important. Uh, when I look at the Bible, I, the Bible doesn't say you have to take out membership of a local church. But it is very clear when you look at the teachings of the Word of God that God wants to create a community and that people need to belong to community. I don't belong to community if I sit at home and I'm not supporting and um, I'm not making the commitments. We're talking about making a commitment. And I believe everything in the Bible points to the fact that I need to make the commitment to belong to a local church. The other uh, wrong view is that the church is sinful, wrong, and made up of sinners, and therefore we need to avoid it. Now, of course, it is true that the church is made up of many sinners, and we are. I am a sinner. Uh, but the ideal in the Bible says that, that God has created a community to whom He wants us uh, to belong. There are some errors related to the local church or to church. Membership of a local church brings salvation. Uh, membership of the church will never ever bring salvation. It can't save you. The only thing that saves us is our faith in Jesus Christ. And if I believe in Jesus, then I want to be part of a faith community. But belonging or taking up membership of the church in itself will not save me. We have another major error, and that is we call it baptismal regeneration. Baptism saves the sinner. Now, the Bible is so clear about that. It's not the water itself that washes me. It is the blood of Jesus. And by confessing my sin, repenting of my sin, uh, that I become a Christian. And that's the only thing that saves me. Baptism cannot save me. Baptism puts the, either the hope if it's an infant, or it puts the seal on the person who's already a Christian. And it's a symbol of salvation. Now, I include some songs and hymns that you can look at uh, expressing um, and here is one where we express our song for unity. Father, make us one, that the world may know you have sent your Son. Father, make us one. I want to encourage you once again to look at the songs you are singing in the church and look for theology, if, if you wish. Look for the teachings that we have been going through. Either our belief in God or creation or salvation or Jesus or the Holy Spirit and now about the church. To do this week, read your work, uh, your prescribed work, and then... Um, pray for your local church, pray for your leaders and its ministries, pray for the church in our country. We, we really need a revival in our country. Uh, people are drifting away from the church, um, but we are essentially a Christian country, but we need to pray for the church to be true and to be faithful and to be pure. And then pray for the church around the world. And then find out where your church fits in. I wonder tonight, even as I was going through the different aspects of church, the leadership style, the polity, um, charismatic or not charismatic, all those kind of things. I wonder if you can plot your church and say, the church that I belong to, uh, I can fit in. If you can't, then you need to go and talk to someone in your church and find out uh, where your church belongs. Or is it an independent church altogether? Um, and so on. So next time we'll be looking at the church's role in the world, focusing primarily on our missionary task uh, around the world. Now, please go and enjoy your church and be a good member of your church.